Praise God. You may be seated. We have a few children that are going to come up and do something for us real quick, and then we're going to our Bible study. I want to mention that if you brought a visitor Sunday, make sure you follow up on that visitor, okay? We're totally dependent on you doing that. We'll try to get some letters out right off to these visitors as much as possible. Uh, but we really need, if you brought a guest or you had a family member or friend that came to church, be sure and thank them, okay? And make contact with them before Sunday. And that will help us. Wasn't it awesome to have 46 people filled with the Holy Ghost Sunday? Wasn't that awesome? Wow, that is, that is wonderful. God's doing great and awesome things. And I know that there will be a lot of them back this coming Sunday. So let's believe the Lord. God is doing great things. Do you have, we have some Bible, some junior Bible quizzers that are going to come up. Uh, Brother Shane Stoops, are you here somewhere? Okay, good. Need to make sure we have a microphone. We'll bring them up here where they can see them. Somebody's. All right, everybody listen very carefully. We have, these little kids are learning the Bible and we want to, we want to encourage that, don't we? Yes, we want right. to support that. So on Sunday, we're going to be selling some chili bowls or some Frito bowls after church for $3 each. And we're going to have some water and some drink that you can purchase too. And we wanted to show you what you're going to be supporting. So between just these three Bible quizzers, they already know 107 verses. And we have... Keith Riggin is also on our team, and he's not here tonight, but if you add that what he knows, we know a lot of verses just between these four quizzers. So we're learning the book of Acts. So McGuire is going to start with just the first few verses of chapter 2. Um, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Um, and suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared clothed tongues like as of fire and it set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance and there were Ju and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how hear we, every man in our own tongue, when we are born? Parthenians and Medes and the Lamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Nigeria and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Creeds and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So we're a little bit nervous because this is the first time we've done it in front of a crowd, but that's just um, a few verses that they know, and we've only been having practices for about three weeks, so we're doing a lot of great stuff. So, so I hope on Sunday that you can support us. Um, we, need we pay for gas to go to our quiz meets and some prizes to try to encourage the kids and things like that. So thank you. I think it's wonderful that they're committing to memory the word of the Lord. And that's something that we all need to, to know what this book has to say. Praise God. Well, it's a great evening and I won't be very long. Just uh, a short time here tonight. But God's going to do some great things. And I want to say thank you for being in Bible study Wednesday nights. I think Wednesday nights are very important for our developing walk with God. So thank you for coming and now thank you for giving it your full attention and then we're going to have a, 
a great time of prayer at the end. And so uh, how many's glad that you're living for God? Good. Hallelujah. It's awesome. And it's great to see those who have just started recently and you're back tonight. Shows me you're serious about it. I'm going to the book of Genesis chapter 19 and verse 26. If you'd like to stand for the read of the word, we'll read just about five verses and I'll let you be seated and I'll stand up the rest of the time while you're sitting. How's that sound? Okay. So uh, that's good. My goodness. Are you ready for this? Hallelujah. Wow. I'm just so excited about what God is doing. God has opened a door for us. And I'm excited about it. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And then I would like to read in Luke 17 and verse 29. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom... It rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away, but he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. And I want to teach for just a few moments on this subject, no turning back. No turning back. Lord Jesus, we give you the praise and the glory. We ask, oh God, your blessings upon this congregation and upon this pastor. We ask you, Lord, that you would even now speak to us and speak through us and let the presence of the Lord fill this house. Lord, I thank you now for the victory that is in the name, the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for the power that is in the blood of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And I give you praise, Lord Jesus. I give you glory. And how many would lift your hands to the Lord right now and just simply give him praise. Hallelujah. 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 We stand in the house of the Lord tonight and we praise you, Jesus. We lift up your name, holy God. You're the one that gives us the strength. You're the one that gives us the ability. You're the one that gives us all good things. And we give you praise. We give you glory in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. For a few moments now, you may be seated. And let's just hear the word of the Lord for a moment or two. Two angels arri arrived at Sodom one evening. Lot was sitting at the city gate. He saw them. He got up to welcome them, bowing before them, and insisted that they, would, they were to come into his house and stay the night and, and be refreshed and rise up the next morning and continue on their way. But they said, no, 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 we will not come to your house. We will sleep on the street. But Lot insisted. He, he wouldn't take no for an answer. And so they reluctantly agreed. And they went home with him. And Lot fixed a hot meal. And they ate. Before they went to bed that night, men from all over the city of Sodom, young and old, descended on the house from all sides and, and boxed them in. They yelled at Lot, and they yelled to Lot. They said, where are the men who are staying with you tonight? Bring them out so we can do whatever we want with them. Lot went out, barring the door behind him, and he was, Lot was a, a gentleman in every sense of the word. And, and so you can see his gentleness when he says uh, something like, please, brethren, don't, don't do this. Uh, don't do this evil thing that you're talking. And then, and then there's something recorded in the word of God that's repugnant and sickening that has taken place in Lot's thinking. Lot has been in Sodom too long. And his ability to reason is not as good as perhaps it once was. And, and so he says, listen, I, I've got two daughters. and they're, they're, They've never been with men. I'll bring them out. But don't touch these guests of mine. They're my guests. And they answered back in 
modern day English, get lost. They said, you drop in from nowhere and now you're trying to tell us how to run our lives. Well, mister, we're going to tell you something, they said. We'll treat you worse than we were going to treat them. And they charged past Lot to, to try to break down the door. But, but the two angels, the Bible tells us, reached out and pulled Lot inside the house and, and locked the door. Then they struck the men blind who were trying to break down the door. You would think immediately that there would be repentance on the part of these perverts that they would repent and say, oh God, I'm blind, I can't see a thing. I've been stricken with blindness, but no, they are so, so messed up in their heads that instead of repenting, they simply tried to find the door. Disregarding their blindness, they, with blinded eyes, are searching for the door that they can find it so they can get in to get to these two men who they do not even realize are not men but angels. So the two men said to Lot, do you have any other family members here? Do you have a son-in-law or sons or daughters? Anybody in the city that you care about? Suddenly Lot's whole mindset changed. Now, up to this point, Lot had been doing very well business-wise. He'd been doing very well in the community as far as uh, making a decent wage and, and uh, living a fine life. And money was not an issue with Lot. But now he realizes at a very, very late moment that, oh my God, while I've been building my financial empire... I haven't shared my faith with my family. And so it was that the angel said, you want to get them out. You want to get them out now because we are going to destroy this place. They said something like the stench of this place has risen up to heaven and We've been sent here to blast this place into oblivion. And it's going to take place right now. Lot went out. I believe that Lot went running out. Suddenly, his priorities were all in place. Unfortunately, a little too late. But now his priorities are all in place. And he went running out. And I believe if you had been there, you would have heard him screaming as he ran out, as he, he went on his way to warn his sons-in-law. And he was arriving at their houses. And he was saying, get out of this place. Get my grandkids. Get my daughter. Meet me at my house. God is going to destroy this city. His sons-in-law, each time he arrived at another son-in-law's home, they thought he was joking. They thought it was some kind of a gag. They, they said, Dad, <laughs> really, what have you been drinking? What have you been smoking? Something's going on with your head. Two angels at your house. They're going to destroy the city like it's going to be over. The fire is going to fall, you say, from heaven. And, and the city is going to cease to be at any moment dead. Really? Come on. And they refuse to believe him. Sometimes when we wait too late to share our faith, people look at us and they think, well, if it was so important, why did you wait until now? Fortunately, God has given us these days that we have right now. And 46 people, thankfully, were filled with the Holy Ghost last Sunday. But when Lot went out to tell his sons-in-law and his daughters and his grandkids, they thought it was the most hilarious joke that they had ever heard. What a joke, they thought. And finally, it was daybreak and the and Lot appears back at the old home place. And his shoulders are slumped and his hands are hanging down. His head's down. His hair is disheveled. And he's saying, not one. 
Not one. Not one of them would believe me. Not one of my kids, married kids, would come. All my grandkids that are out there, they're not going to make it. And my daughters are not going to make it. And he's dragging his feet. It's daybreak now. And the angels push Lot to get going. They said something like, hurry, get your wife and your two single daughters that are here in the home with you before it's too late and you're caught in the punishment of the city. Lot was dragging his feet. The men grabbed Lot's arm and the arm of his wife and the arm of his daughters. And, and the Bible said that God being merciful unto them and dragged them, literally, can you imagine, had to drag them to safety outside the city. And, and when the angels had Lot and his wife and his two daughters outside, they were told, now, escape to the mountain, lest you also be consumed. Go, go now, escape to the mountain, don't look back. And they said, don't stay anywhere on the plain. This whole plain's going to be on fire. Escape to the mountain lest you be consumed. Now, I, I want to stop and just say something to you that I think is very, very important. Once you begin to make your great escape from your old life, and you begin to make your escape from impending disaster and, and the fire that's going, the Bible says this earth is going to be destroyed by fire. Living for God is not just something you do because it's, uh, it's better and it's nicer and it's more peaceful and it's more joyful. It is all those things, but that's not the biggest reason. The biggest reason is this earth is getting ready to explode like a big can of TNT. It's getting ready to go off and, and every living thing in it is going to pay the ultimate price and God has prepared a way for you and I to escape, to live peacefully while we're here and to escape the judgment that is to come. So he said, don't stay in the plane. You know what that means for you and I? When, you, when God saves you, don't, don't just get right outside of Sodom and say, well, that's good enough. I'm outside the city. No, you don't understand. You don't stop. You get your stuff and you get moving. And, and, and you go on and live for God and, and you go as close to God as you can get. And, and that's the mountain, you know. You get on that mountaintop with Jesus. Don't stay in the plain. Don't say, well, I, I made it outside the burning city, so I guess I'm okay. No, you don't stop. You're not home yet. Amen. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. Uh, sometimes... Some folks scare me. They, they get just enough God just to get barely outside the gate of hell. And then they want to camp there. And I'm saying, you don't understand the concussion. You don't understand the explosion. You don't understand that, that if you're that close to the fire, you're still going to be annihilated. Escape to the mountain lest you be consumed. Don't leave your old life and then stay as close to it as you can. So, Lot argued with the angels. And, and I'm trying to give it to you in, in modern terms. He said, I, I know you've, you've taken a liking to me. I know you've done me an immense favor. I know you're saving my life and my wife's life and my two daughters. But I can't run for the mountains that would kill me. I can't make it to the mountains. I, I just physically cannot make it. And he said, look over there. And, and they looked in the direction Lot was pointing. And he said, there's a, there's a small town that's close enough for me to get to. It's, please, sirs, it's just a small town. You might call it just a wide spot in the road. Hardly anything to it, not even a traffic light. Would you let me just escape there, please? And they said, okay. You know, God's not trying to make your life hard. He just wants you to be safe. So, so the angel said, see, 
we've accepted you in this. Go on. Get to that town. And so the Bible said that the sun was risen when Lot arrived at the little town called Zoar. And then the Bible says that God rained brimstone and fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah. The best way that I think I could explain it would be there was a river of lava that began to shoot forth from heaven. Molten, sulfuric, sulfuric, molasses-like lava. Hot, sticky. Once it touched, it was over. A sea of lava shooting out like bolts of fire from heaven and encapsulating and covering and destroying. It destroyed the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But remember he said, don't stay in the plain. And if you read the story, you'll find out that the entire plain was destroyed. See, if you stay too close to your old life, you're still going to get destroyed. You got to leave that behind. I, you know, I've told everybody this, and I'll tell you, you can't have what God has for you until you let go of what you have. When your hand is closed like a fist, God can't put something in your hand. You got to open it. So God can put something better in your hand. Don't worry. Anything you give up for Jesus Christ, God will give you something far better back. But he can't give it to you when your hand is closed and you're holding desperately onto things that really doesn't matter. So, so this river of lava was screaming out of the skies destroying everything, the entire plain, everyone who lived in Sodom, everyone who lived in Gomorrah, every plant, every blade of grass, every animal, there was nothing left. It was truly scorched earth. It was a lava field, molten and hot, and perhaps for a little while like a liquid sea. Get the picture. God puts pictures in the Bible so we can understand things. Word pictures. This is not just something that we're doing or we should be doing haphazardly. We are escaping something that is monumental. We're escaping something that is so hellish that the human mind can't even really grasp it. We can't really picture it. But the Bible tries to give us word pictures so we can understand that whatever you do when you escape hell, escape it as well and get as far away from it as you can because hell is hell. Amen. And so the sounds of destruction were absolutely deafening. Now, some of you have been in the military and some of you have seen large artillery pieces go off and you know how deafening that can be and that is just a drop in the bucket to the sounds that were being heard that day as as you hear the screaming of those capsules of lava flowing and firing from heaven you can literally hear it screaming you probably could hear the sound barrier being broken there was there were probably several sonic booms. And, and uh, what I'm trying to point out to you is that it was, it was loud, so deafening loud that the ground literally shook. Reverberating, echoing everywhere. And that's when it happened. Lot's wife heard the scream of those ornaments that are screaming through the air and the explosion as they hit and the instant combustion of buildings. And, and it was just unbelievable. And perhaps as a mother, she thought she heard 
a scream. Perhaps she thought she heard the scream of a child or the scream of a grandchild. And that mama whipped around and she looked back. And the Bible says that Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. She was struck dead where she stood. Yet her body did not fall down. It stood fixed and erect like a pillar or like a monument, not liable to waste or decay as human bodies are when exposed to air. But she was changed in a millisecond into a pillar of salt which would last perpetually. One thousand nine hundred thirty-one years later, Jesus was teaching one day. And as he was teaching, he said in Luke 17, 28, Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Then he looked at them and he said, even thus, just like that, it shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, don't even bother to go back and get your stuff. And he that is in the field, don't go back to get something that you think you may have lost. He said, remember, remember how it was in Lot's day. It was so quick. It was so sudden. It was so instantaneous. He said, and I want to tell you that when, when the day when it's time for the Lord to be revealed, he said, don't even go back to the house to get your stuff. In other words, He's using some symbolism here. He's saying, don't get confused. Don't get mixed up. Don't, don't decide that, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll go back into a few things that I thought I was going to leave behind, but I think I'll go back and get them. He said, in that day, if you're on the housetop and your stuff is in the house, don't go down to take it away. Just stay up on the housetop. And if you're in the field, don't go back. And then he stopped, he paused, and he said, remember Lot's wife. What? Why are you saying this? That happened 1,931 years ago, Jesus. He said, I want you to remember Lot's wife. And I want to tell you something, that whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. You better remember Lot's wife, he said, because if you're so concerned about all your stuff, and you're so concerned about all your things, and you're, you're so concerned about the things of this world, Remember Lot's wife, she was too. And when she heard the reverberating booms and, and all the noise and the trembling of the ground, she turned around and she looked and I told her, do not look back, but she did. And I'm telling you that it's the same thing now, that if you seek to save your life and get all the stuff you can get out of this life, you are going to lose it and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. If you'll give it all to me, I know it's ironic, but I'll give it back to you. I tell you in that night, there shall be two in one bed. One shall be taken and the other shall be left and two shall be grinding grain or doing housework together. The one shall be taken 
and the other left. And on that day when I come, two shall be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. So I want you to remember Lot's wife. And I want you to remember no turning back. It would be so foolish for you to turn back. How the devil would love for me to turn back. You know, there is a war going on that's raging right now between good and evil. There is a fixed battle that's going on and, and Satan is going to be ultimately crushed. Peace and good between good and evil is impossible. And you need to understand that if you're living for God, you're going to have some warfare. Don't look around and say, why my God, why am I having this battle? Well, are you on God's side? Of course you're going to have a battle. Don't think as though some strange thing, why would I be having a trial like this? Or why would I be having a temptation like this? I want you to notice that we are foolish if we expect to serve God without opposition. If you think that living for God down here is just going to be pie in the sky and there's not going to be opposition, oh boy. You're going to find out that there is a fight between good and evil. As a matter of fact, if you're not having any opposition, chances are you're on the wrong side. Yeah, right. Glory to God. I know who wins this war. The great dragon will be cast out and forever destroyed. And those who are true to Jesus will receive a crown. And here I'm getting ready to get done and we're going to have prayer. He said, be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Some people are a little scary. Because they're not understanding that. It's be thou faithful until. Be thou faithful until death. Don't give up. Don't turn around. Remember Lot's wife. Don't stop now. I have to take a look at what I'm doing for God. I want to be sure I'm heading in the right direction. I don't want to be praying less now than I used to. Reading the Bible less than I used to. Less interested in God than I used to be. I want to be more interested in God. I want to be more doing the things of God, right? Because I want to be faithful unto death. And he said, if you'll be faithful unto death, I will give thee a crown of life. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 and 8, he said, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So tonight, let's sharpen our swords. Let's pray that the Holy Ghost would strengthen us for the fight. No battle is so important, and no crown is so glorious as the one that God is going to give to you. No fight is more important than this fight. And no crown is more glorious than the crown that God has for you. But I'll tell you something. You're going to have to rise up and draw your spiritual sword. You're going to have to declare yourself as to where you stand. And don't stay in the plain. For God's sake, don't stay in the plain. Right. Escape to the mountain, lest thou also be consumed. Victory in Jesus. No turning back. And I close with one final verse. It's Romans 16, 20. And it says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Peace is not something that only happens when everything's tranquil in your world. Peace is when the storms of life are blowing, but you have peace in your heart because you've got Jesus in your heart. Yes. Things can be stormy outside, but you can be at peace. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet 
shortly. The trial that you're going through right now will be short-lived. It's not going to go on indefinitely. I know the devil's trick is to make you think that the trial you're going through right now has no ending, but that's not true. The trial you're going through will be shortly over and you'll be moving to another victory and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. It'll be very soon. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. His grace is with you right now. And somebody said amen. amen. Hey lady, why don't you just stay in the plane? No. I've come too far to miss heaven now. Hey guy, why don't you just call it quits and throw in the towel and say, well, I guess the good guys don't always win. I don't think I can make this one. No, I've gone too far to fail him now. I'm believing God for the greatest revival we have ever seen. I'm, re I'm believing God for the greatest miracles in your lives and in my life that we've ever seen. And the God of peace shall, shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Whew. Now, Father... I just felt the breath of the Holy Ghost breathe into this place life and strength and help. Lord, I know that the devil would love to roar like a lion and scare somebody to death. But Father, you are the God of peace and you said that you shall bruise Satan under our feet shortly. Amen. And your grace is sufficient and your power is able Lord Jesus here I am I give myself afresh and anew there's no turning back for me I wonder is there anybody here tonight that would say to God Lord I want to live for you and there's no turning back come on now you you, you can't be looking back over your shoulder and and be saved. You've got to... A, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You can't be saying, I'm going to live for God, and, and then, well, I'm not sure. Well, I guess I will know all much. An unstable man is... Unst a a double-minded man is unstable in all, all his ways. That man's not going to receive anything from the Lord. But the person who says, God, I'm in this. I'm in. I'm in. May God give me the strength. May God give me the grace. May God give me the power that I need. I've got to win this fight. Well, why do you have to win that fight, Dad? I've got some kids that are following behind me. Why do you have to win that fight, Mom? I've got some kids that are following behind me. Why do you have to win that fight, young person? I've got friends that if they see I can make it, then they can make it also. May God help me. I've got to win this fight. I'll have to be honest with you. I haven't won every skirmish. I haven't won every battle. There's been times when I've fallen and made a mistake along the way. And I'm talking to somebody right now that the enemy would like for you to think that because you have made a mistake somewhere along the way that now there's absolutely no hope. Nothing could be further from the truth. All God's looking for is someone that's got a made up mind that says, God, I know I haven't always got it right, but I'll tell you one thing. There's a desire, there, there is a desire in my heart to live for you. And God, I want to serve you with all my heart. Please forgive me for every time I failed, for every time I've fallen, for every time I've fallen short of the mark, for everything that's unlike you in my life. Forgive me, Father. I ask you again. And I believe that you do forgive me, God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. I want you to bow your head with me just for a moment. 
I love you, Jesus. Is there anybody in this house right now that wants to give your heart and your life to Jesus and you know you can't do it by yourself? You know you need God to help you. You know that there's no way that you can do this. Matter of fact, you've got to do something because if you don't, you're going to sink beneath the waves and there's nothing anybody's going to be able to do to help you at that point. But today, this is the day of salvation. This is the day that God is stretching out his hand toward you and he's saying, you know, son, just take my hand. I'm going to get you out of this mess. You know, daughter, take my hand. I, I, I'm going to get you out of this mess. I'm going to help you. And God will do it right now. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Saints, would you pray with me right now? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I'll tell you what I want. I want God to live in my life and in my heart. I want the Spirit of God living in my life. I do not want to be in that burning city. I don't want to be one of the guys that's left behind. But God, I want to be one of those that's taken that goes with you when you come. And I know there's other people that feel the same way I feel right now. And I wonder... I wonder if there's someone right now that would say, God, here I am. I'm not going to turn around. I'm going to live for you and serve you with all of my heart. I will. And would you rise to your feet, please, everybody that's in the building? Would you rise with me, please? I love you, Jesus. I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you, God. Hallelujah. I feel Jesus in this place. I feel him in this place. Now, well, every head's bowed and every eye's closed. And if you just give us just a moment, we'll be letting you go in just a moment now. Where is the person who says, God, I need you more than anything. And I don't care what anybody else does. It's none of my business what anybody else does, but I know what I need to do. God, I'm going to give my heart and my life to you, Lord. Please stop. I'm going to give my heart and my life to you, Jesus. Here I am. I wouldn't be pulling like this if there weren't people who need it so desperately. And so here we are. And God is able and he's willing. In the name of Jesus. Just say, excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, sir. This is the hardest part for somebody is to step out of the pew. And the reason I have you do that is because if you have to take action, if you don't take action, then and folks are starting to come. And you can also, if this is your first time or your 100th time, find a place to pray. Say, God, here I am. I want to give my heart and my life to you. Folks are coming from all over the place right now. God, help me not to turn around. Saints of God, would you help me pray? I feel like somebody tonight's going to get a deliverance. I, I've been praying and fasting today because I felt like tonight is deliverance night for somebody. So would you pray with me right now? If you've got the Holy Ghost, would you pray just for a few minutes really hard? If you don't have the Holy Ghost, would you pray real hard too? And let's ask God that he would have his way in our lives tonight because the spirit of the Lord is here he's here to deliver I love you Jesus God I love you Jesus